So good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is Mariah Roberts with Difference Consulting, and it's my honor to welcome you to this interactive session. Um, please note that you'll be muted during the presentation, but we want and need to hear your voice. While we settle in, I want you to go ahead and open the chat feature and start by just chatting in where you are in the world today. That chat feature is very important during this session. It's where you're going to share ideas, expertise, potentially, and also questions, most importantly, for our presenters. This session is focused on youth and digital engagement. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed a huge variation in responses to the needs and well-being of adolescents and young people in different communities. The pandemic has also highlighted failures to engage young people in issues that affect their well-being and to reach young people with much needed information and access to services. This session will allow participants, you all, to identify opportunities to build on current engagement strategies, promote co-learning across platforms and generations, and develop capacity for young people to engage strategically at community level as part of the response to that pandemic. We have uh, two amazing presenters today, um, and I want to welcome Dr. Chandra Muli, who works uh, in adolescent sexual and reproductive and health rights, uh, and Toyin Chukwadozie um, as well uh, from Nigeria. Um, really, without any further ado, I want to go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Chandra, um, who will start our presentation. Welcome. Thank you, Maria, and greetings, everyone, from uh, WHO and on behalf of Toyn and myself. In this very, uh, in the, over the next 10 minutes, we want to uh, put some points on the table to stimulate our discussion. The next slide, please. Last year, UNESCO, the UN agency uh, responsible for leading our work on sexuality education along with UNFPA, organized a meeting called Switched On, Sexuality Education in the Digital Space. And this technical brief is available in the public arena. And I just want to make three points, the second, third, and fourth points on this slide. Um, there's, while many young people are in fact reaching to the uh, online, uh, and, and on the slide, you see the kinds of things that they're looking for, you know, about sexual pleasure, about masturbation, about contraception, about LGBTQ issues. We don't know how well uh, they're engaging, who, who's engaging, who's not, and how they're doing so. We need more research in that area. There's lack of attention to the quality of information and education available. Um, and uh, we don't know very much about the impact of digital technology on young people's knowledge or behavior, particularly in the global south. And this is an issue um, because we, we know that it improves knowledge and uh, attitudes. And we also know that it cannot be a solution on its own. The next slide, please. UNFPA, uh, the United Nations Population Fund, is just about to publish this document, International Technical and Programmatic Guidance on Out-of-School uh, Comprehensive Sexuality Education. And this document talks about all the approaches to reach a whole range of young people outside the school setting, including school-going adolescents, children and adolescents themselves outside the school setting. And what they've done is that uh, in terms of pros for digital interventions, many young people are already confident and using technology, as I said in the previous slide, and digital interventions can contribute to many things listed on this slide, and I won't go point by point, but one important issue is that um, they can reach a specific groups of young people with tailored information and services. For, in, for instance, young people living with HIV or those who are intersex, or those who are um, uh, who uh, who have who identify themselves as LGBTQ, um, and so that's very important. So this is these are issues that are very difficult to address in the classroom, even in the most liberal countries. But 
there are many um, potential disadvantages as well, again, listed on this slide. And I'm just going to point to two. One is uh, inequities. We, we've seen uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement, it started in the US and has now become worldwide, that inequities are a huge problem. And, um, and this could uh, accentuate that. The last point is this whole issue of privacy and, and confidentiality and security. Who owns the mobile device? Who has access to it? Who knows what's happening in that mobile, de mobile device? The next slide, please. So WHO is just about to publish this document, which is titled Youth Center Digital Health Interventions, a Framework for Planning, Developing and Implementing Solutions with and for young people. And what this says is, um, as you move forward, based on you know, 15 years of experience, what is the best way we can use this technology? Um, and and the, I just want to highlight the first and third points. We need to use technology to complement rather than rep, uh, replace in-person inter interventions delivered by capable and trusted adults. So it's not digital interventions instead of, it's digital interventions as part of a package of interventions. And to build on what already exists and use expertise that is already available, including young people themselves from start to finish. So I've talked to you about uh, the evidence and I've talked to you now about tools, three tools by three different UN agencies. I want to move to the next part of my presentation, which is presenting one example from India. Um, next slide. The next slide, please. Love Matters is India's leading digital sexual and reproductive health and rights um, initiative. And it caters to the needs of 18 to 24 years. It's a great site. Um, you know, I, I, uh, go to, I look at it from time to time to look at the interesting um, uh, items that they post. You know, I've encouraged my nephews and nieces uh, to look at it as well. I think it's a great site and it's doing things that uh, wouldn't be po we didn't think possible to be uh, to be uh, done in India. But they've now just started an initiative called the Teen Book, and the rationale for the Teen Book is that the uh, the young adolescents are generally left out of these discussions, even by Love Matters, which caters to 18 to 24 year olds. And so, like you know, they say you you can learn how to drive a car, and you can teach someone. Uh, someone can teach you about trigonometry and how to use a computer, but you know many of life's decisions you kind of learn on your own because nobody wants to talk to you about it. Strange, isn't it? You know, people teach you how to cross the road and how to get the right change when you buy a loaf of bread and how not to cut your fingers when you're uh, using a knife, but you know they don't teach you about sex. They don't teach you about menstruation. Um, uh, so many people in India, but all over the world, learn about their periods on the day their periods start. And any discussion about sexuality is about negative and avoiding diseases. But we all know that sex is about pleasure. It's about masturbation. It's about enjoying sex with a partner um, in a stable relationship or outside a stable relationship. Next and last slide from my segment of the presentation. So the Teen Book is an initiative, one of many initiatives that we uh, could feature here. It, it's available on the internet. They're going to post it on Apple and Android. And, and what they're going to try to do is to link it up to uh, teachers and parents so that not only is it a site for young people, but it's also for a site for the, in, the, the important group of adults around young people who themselves have no capacity or preparation to respond to their needs. I, um, you know, I'm 61 years old, my son is 31. You know, I remember he asked me, do you masturbate? And you know, these are difficult questions to answer. And that's what parents need help with. I'm going to pass on the baton to Toy to take it to the next uh, part of this presentation. Next slide, please, Jack. Thank you so much, Chandra. Um, I'm going to be presenting some examples from Nigeria. So just like Chandra has shown us, from medium income to low income countries, the use of digital technologies and digital media is valuable in reaching adolescents and youth. And like I said, I'll be sharing some examples from Nigeria. 
Education as a Vaccine is a youth serving organization in Nigeria that has extensively leveraged the use of technology in engaging adolescents and young people. Um, next slide, please. In Nigeria, the majority of adolescents and young people in urban and semi-urban settings, and even in some rural settings, have access to mobile phones more than any other type of technology gadgets. And also, adolescents and youth majorly use digital platforms in Nigeria to source information or to have conversations. And so this has formed the basis for the different ways in which we are reaching, the, we are reaching and engaging um, adolescents and youth and also for the types of digital platforms we have created and also leveraged to engage youth. So the first um, we have is an SMS-based platform. It's known as the My Question and Answer platform. It's a, non it's a confidential and non-judgmental service. It's anonymous. It provides a platform for young people to ask questions and get their answers from a trained counselor on their sexual and reproductive health and rights, and also on their relationship concerns. So they can actually text their questions to a toll-free short code, and they can get answers also via SMS. Um, the platform also has the functionality of a, a, a hotline. So it's just a phone line where a young person can phone in and speak to a counselor. Um, during this pandemic, young people have used this platform to ask questions relating to their SRH and also COVID-19 related concerns have also been addressed on this platform. Toyin, Toyin, this is Mariah. Can yeah. I ask that you turn your, your camera on? It may, okay. I think it will improve also our ability to, uh, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, so I've spoke about, I've talked about the SMS based platform and um, what we have next, the um, mobile applications. So we have also created mobile apps. We have two Android mobile applications that young people can um, get information on their sexual and reproductive health. Um, one is called Frisky. And um, Frisky is a sexual health and information and also a risk assessment app. It empowers young people to seek for accurate information on their sexual reproductive health and rights. Um, it enables them to assess their sexual health risks. And also information is there about taking steps to minimize or eliminate such um, risks. Um, so Frisky is also is available on Google Play Store and actually older adolescents are um, the, the, the content is, it was fashion for older adolescents, but it's available on the Google Play Store. We also have another one called Diva. Um, Diva is a menstrual health and care app. Um, it helps adolescent girls and young women to learn more about their menstrual health, hygiene, menstrual management. Um, they, they can also learn about preventing early and unintended pregnancies. Um, it's also on the Google Play Store. So we've used this period of the pandemic and the lockdowns to even promote these apps more for young people to download and use. Um, lastly, I'll talk about our use of social media. We've leveraged social media to share sexual reproductive health information and to share information on COVID-19 and how it's affecting adolescents and young people. We do this on a daily basis on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Twitter. We've shared information about simple and practical ways of preventing the COVID-19 infection, um, of preventing the spread of the virus. We've shared information, busting myth and tackling a lot of misinformation that is out there. We've shared information around coping mechanisms, especially to deal with mental health. Um, we've also shared um, helplines, especially for those who might be experiencing gender-based violence while at home. We've shared helplines on how and where they can ask, um, access such help. Next slide. So in, in summary, um, I guess what we're trying to put out very clearly here is that we know very well that there are different factors that affect access and use of digital platforms. There are there are contextual factors. There's the issue of costs. There's the issue of digital gatekeepers, including parents and teachers, like Chandra mentioned in his presentation, who actually has access to the phone, who is holding the phone 
or who is holding the digital device when the young person needs to use it or when the young person needs information. So these are factors that affect um, access and use. But we really have to accept that digital technology is here to stay. And it is important that we leverage its advantage to the full. We need to take advantage of digital technology. And just like Chandra said, I'll just reiterate that indeed not to replace face-to-face -face engagement or to replace human engagement, but to complement it. And so we know that there are, like, there, are exam there are so many examples of how it's been effective. So it's, it's important that we leverage the, the full advantage of digital technology. There is need for us to collaborate better. There's need for better collaboration in using digital platforms um, to reach the youth. We need to be meaningfully involved. Young people need to be meaningfully involved. We're talking about our lives here. So our voices must be heard. Our opinions and views must be valued. And our contributions to our own development and well-being must be appreciated, must be prioritized, and must be acted on, even in the use of digital uh, um, platforms to reach youth. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you all. Um, just to um, just to reiterate for folks who may have joined after we started, um, my name is Mariah Roberts with a different consulting. I'm humbled to be here today. Um, our our um, presenters today um, again are Dr. Chandra Mauli and Toyin Chakwadozie. Um, we are so pleased to have them, and I wanted to move now into a question and answer um, uh, part of this session and remember we still have about um, a half an hour which is wonderful and so there's a lot that we can get into um, and really we want that to come from all of you. Um, I'm going to start with a question that both um, has come up in previous conversation but also I see um, in the chat um, and just remember please don't hesitate ask questions uh, we can't unmute everyone right now but put them into the chat we'll be monitoring that and get them to the presenter. Um, I wanted uh, um, Chandra to ask you about what makes digital approaches um, have a unique contribution over and above other approaches under COVID-19. And if you could speak to that unique role that digital approach plays. Uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, uh, just two quick points. One is that um, uh, in these weeks and months of the, um, that we've all been coming to terms with COVID-19, um, two organizations, many organizations are gathering information from young people. But I'd just like to talk about two organizations. One is Population Council, uh, which is based in New York, but has branches all over the world. And the other one is called GAGE, you know, the General and Adolescent Global Evidence. And these two organizations are involved in research in a number of countries. Um, and what they have done is they have leveraged uh, digital technologies, uh, mobile phones, to gather information from young people in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Bangladesh, in Ethiopia, um, through the networks that they already have. And they've already published reports four weeks ago. So we had data that they could generate and, and collect because they had they had, they had networks on the ground, they knew whom to speak to, but they were not allowed to send out researchers and, uh, and did not want to because of the fears, but they could use digital uh, technology. Of course, that's only one many approaches in digital media, but this is one concrete example where they didn't need to wait for everything to settle and everything to become okay before the researchers could go out. That's, that's one, one very important issue. Um, the, the other one uh, is that um, in, in many places now, um, what is beginning to happen, and this is something WHO strongly recommended, is that um, uh, we start using telephones for mobile consultations for people uh, who want contraceptive services and other health services. Uh, you know, services have been disrupted. People are scared to come to services because of infection. And what many countries are beginning to do with WHO guidance is to reduce all the uh, uh, policy barriers requiring prescription and encouraging, um, uh, you know, mobile consultations, tele telemedicine, if you like, to use this approach to uh, to provide services. So this is these are two very special things that uh, that um, 
that uh, digital interventions could do. There are others um, about reaching young people with information, but perhaps um, Toyin could speak to that. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Chandra. Toyin, do you want to um, continue on that topic? Okay, just briefly, yes. Um, I agree that um, young people are actually um, so much on um, tech platforms, and this is an opportunity that we can use um, to reach them with information. Just like I'd mentioned in my presentation, during the COVID-19 pandemic, during this lockdown, you know, that everybody had been at home, it was critical to still continue to provide information on sexual and reproductive health, provide information about um, avoiding um, risky behaviors and all of that, dispel myths and misconceptions around the COVID-19 pandemic, and also link um, young people up to services, especially like GBV services. So yes, this it's, it's really a useful, tool. it's really very valuable at this point. And like I said earlier, this is something that we need to concentrate on how best, you know, to take the full advantage of digital technologies for reaching young people. But it's a very critical tool for programming, for ensuring that, you know, the lives of young people, uh, their contributions to their own lives and well-being are uh, uh, being taken accounted, are uh, being accounted for and is meaningful and that we're reaching them with what they need for time. Thank you. Thank you, Toyan, so much. Um, you know, um, I'm, you know, I'm seeing both in the chat and also in both of your presentations, the, the reality that really digital technology is something that we're building upon, that, you know, many young people are already using. They already have these networks that can be accessed rather than recreated, which is, which is an incredible asset. Um, however, um, not everyone has a great internet. Not everyone has access to technology. I, I'd love to um, just have you muse about, upon who could be getting left out? Um, what needs to happen to prevent this from being um, a barrier to some of these new and exciting tools? Uh, uh, Chandra, you wanna jump in? Yes, please. Um, uh, and thank you. Thank you for the question. And I think it's a very important one. And if you go to um, uh, the, my second slide uh, on this UNESCO document on, called Switch Strong, one of the points they have is that if there were 100 people in the world, who would be off online? And in Africa, three and a half people would be online. In the Arab states, three people would be online. In Asia and the Pacific, you know, 20, over 20, 25 would be online. In Europe, uh, most people would be online. In the Americas, three quarters of people would be online. So there are huge divides um, across different parts of the world. And even within um, uh, regions and countries, there are divides. So there's geography, uh, and then there's the issue of wealth, of course. Um, and then there's the issue of, of uh, sex and gender. Uh, you know, men are much more likely to have access to this. Boys are much more likely to have access to this. Older boys and older girls are much more likely to have access to digital technology. So clearly, there are many people who could be left out. Um, uh, having said that, um, access is improving, networks are improving, and, um, and um, the fact that we can reach a segment of the population is a first step. Um, uh, there is no reason to leave them out while we look for alternative approaches to reach those people who are not being uh, reached through, uh, through mobile media. Um, I just want to say one other thing. Uh, you know, we talk about lack of access. But um, uh, Pono, I, I had a colleague working in Save the Children who told me, you know, 10 years ago in Bena, they could get little, little small uh, chips that they could slot into their small black phones to watch pornography. Technology can be innovative. It can be adapted to use local methodologies. And, and we can use available technologies to reach access while knowing that there'll be groups who are left out who are left out of everything. They are left out of drinking water. You know, we still have many parts of the world without access to drinking water. And that's the reality. Uh, but um, uh, this is a technology that we cannot ignore and cannot not use. Over to you, Maria. Thank you so much. And Toyin, I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, you're working, you know, with young people. Um, 
I'd love to hear um, perhaps uh, uh, if you've seen, um, uh, you know, professionals already involved with the youth, for example, educators or other um, um, resources who can, uh, can sort of provide a bridge. We had a, a, qu a question about that um, from a participant. I'm sorry, I didn't get the last thing you said. So sorry. Um, so uh, the question is whether um, educators, teachers, um, who may have some access to digital um, uh, resources can be a bridge to reach uh, students who may not, uh, if you've seen that play out at all in your work. Okay, um, I'll say not exactly in the way that you have put it, but it, whether they can serve as a bridge, definitely. But there's also the issue, like I had mentioned in my presentation, of them being gatekeepers. So we find that in our own setting, adults are very authoritative, authoritative and um, the our, our own, in our own context, young people are not believed to have the agency. They're not, they don't have the agency. They don't, believe, they don't believe that their contributions are valuable. And so there's this adult um, authoritarian kind of relationship that exists that can hamper the success of such, you know, bridging of gaps. So for us, it's, it's in how best to reach different segments of um, different subgroups of young people is what we have taken into consideration to develop different approaches. So we know that th definitely there are people who are not in very good network areas and they can still have basic SMS. They can have, they can receive a text message. They can send a text message. They can make a basic phone call. And so then we, ha we, we can provide a hotline like we have one. We can provide services is via SMS like we have one. Some people are in other regions where they can send a WhatsApp message. And so that's a different category of people who can at least get information via WhatsApp. And so we can provide information via WhatsApp as well. And we also have like developing um, the apps on uh, the Android apps. That's young people who are in more urban settings, you know, have access to data and all of that can download. And there's also the issue of not all young people are in schools. So if we're talking about educators and all of that, that means we are also focusing on in-school adolescents or in-school young people, and not all young people are in school. So, oh. Torian, we've lost your connection just for a moment. I'm sure that you will be back. Um, while we wait for it to come in. back, Maria, what I'd uh, like to do Echo, or oh, she's back. Go ahead, Go ahead Toyin, we can hear you. Ah, she's, she's paused again. Um, uh, Chandra, can I, can I rephrase? I think I, I didn't phrase that question quite right. There's a question uh, from Aparajita Gagoy, um, and she asks, uh, or they ask, um, what are the best ways of making intermediates like teachers and parents who are not digital natives, more accepting, better prepared um, to deal with modes of digital delivery. So perhaps recognizing they could be a barrier and then having that as something to tackle. Um, thank you. You know, Aparajita Gogoi is a good friend. Uh, she's um, one of my heroes. The work she's done in Jharkhand, in India and in Bihar and in India um, shows that you can do uh, sexuality education. And you know, uh, Aparajita, I'm going to answer your question with what I've learned from your work. You know, when you have data uh, and you can present it to, uh, to people um, and data gathered over time, um, the writing on the wall is very clear to them. The Udan program that Aparajita leads, like many other sexuality education programs in India, are not called sexuality education. They're called the adolescent education program, and they were di directed to older adolescents. And over a three to four year period, um, um, Aparajita and her team gathered information to make the point that uh, to make uh, to make the point that older adolescents were busy with exams, they were not ready to engage in these issues, uh, and they really needed to reach younger adolescents. And they got a policy directive to reach younger adolescents. So, so my sense is to be patient, that you know, um, engaging parents, teachers, um, and other decision makers takes time. If we can uh, gather information and point to the need, 
and also to the fact that these programs don't cause harm. Um, that's the only way to bring them on board. And it's a process. It's a process of bringing people on board with, with identifying some early innovators who might be willing to come on board. And I don't think it will happen from one day to the next. Um, in the Global Early Adolescent Study uh, that, I was, uh, that we are involved in with Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, learning how young boys and girls learn uh, of their roles as males and females, parents are extremely worried about adolescents' friends and about media. They're very suspicious about this. These are two things that worry them a lot. They want to protect their adolescents from this. And you know, they, they look at every friend that the boy or girl brings into the house with suspicion. And, and they are very, very worried about the media and sometimes for good reason. So I think we need to bring them on board slowly and in a step-by-step -step way. Um, I don't want to lose the point that Toyin made before she was cut out. And the point she made, a very important point, is that there are different types of media that you can use in different levels of connectivity. And even where connections are very weak, you can at least use an SMS system. And that's very important. It's not as if there's a, you know, all or nothing. Perhaps Toyin is back and can continue what she was saying, because I think that's a very important point. You know, Nigeria is a country of extremes, very rich and very poor. And, and, you know, very good connection and very poor connection almost uh, next to each other, like India is. Toy. Yes. Thank you so much, Chandra. But I think you really summarized the point I was trying to make in that there are different categories of um, tech, tech applications that we can use to reach different groups of young people to ensure that nobody is being left out. We still agree that there's still the issue of accessibility for the very poor. And... Um, there's so many issues around that, but just like you, have, like we have both said, you know, there's SMS, there's WhatsApp, there's the apps. There are just different levels, you know, that can cater to the different categories, to the different locations of young people. And also to add to what you have said about um, involvement of parents and involvement of adults, um, something that I was reminded of is that even here in Nigeria, when we, when um, things like something like the family health education curriculum was being developed. So there's a consultative process where there's also parents involved. There's also people from the different uh, ministries and departments of the government who are also parents and adults are involved so that they understand the process, understand what exactly is going on, what exactly is in the document. Because there's a tendency for people to say that you're teaching children something else, you're teaching adolescents something else because they don't understand it. And so that's, that's, that's how um, we try to bring them in to say, okay, this is what you know, we want to do. And we, your inputs are also um, necessary because if you see your child or your adolescent or young person assessing certain um, information, then you're not supposed to be like surprised or scared that this is something that, you know, is it's or is something that is worrisome. You should understand that this is actually helping you have a conversation with your child that you're not able to have, you're not comfortable having. So I think I want to leave it at that so that we can maybe attend to the other questions. Maria, there was Thank a you. question yes. in the chat. Could I, could I address? Yes, please, that? please, please jump in. Yes. Um, you know, one of, the, the, one of the questions was about uh, teen book and, you know, what, what are they planning to do to reach um, parents, um, uh, teachers, and even young people who don't have access to media? And, uh, and I'm speaking for teen book, but I know that I'm speaking for many other organizations. Before I joined WHO 25 years ago, I lived and worked in Zambia, in, in northern Zambia, uh, in, in southern Africa. And um, uh, uh, there was a wonderful initiative uh, run by an organization called Strategies for Hope, which worked with small Christian communities uh, to talk to them about parenting. You know, WHO talks about parents as having five roles. One is to give unconditional love. Second is to set limits with the adolescents and then help uh, regulate these, uh, the application of these limits. The third is role modeling, you know, role modeling behavior. You can't talk about gender equality and treat your wife with disrespect or your, your sisters with disrespect. The, the third one is, um, the fourth one is protection and provision. And the last one is responding to evolving capacity. You know, 
dealing with a 12 year old differently from dealing with a four year old and dealing with an 18 year old differently from a 12 year old. And they would have workshops in these churches um, um, uh, uh, to engage parents. And I think that's exactly the model uh, the teen book uh, plans to use, to use, uh, to workshop with teachers, parents, and other adults um, um, and combine digital um, outreach with face-to-face -face outreach so that they are seen as part of one. Uh, and I don't think even just because you have digital outreach, it doesn't mean that these face-to-face -face outreach and these workshops are not important. One of the things we have learned is um, the best way to engage challenge norms, challenge racism, like, you're, like you have this discussion going on in the US, but we have all in India and elsewhere, we have all the other things. We have, you know, casteism, we have, um, uh, uh, you know, skin color. Um, uh, there are many other biases, and the only, those are dealt with in discussions among peers. And so th that's the approach I believe Teen Book plans to take. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I just have to say, as the mother of a 12 and 14 year old, I am not only uh, learning, I am also taking notes for my uh, personal life here. Um, uh, thank you all for all of your work. Um, I wanted to ask, um, Esther had a question about um, cyber-related danger, and I know um, both of you spoke to the fact that many parents have hesitation, perhaps, um, uh, while also, um, you know, uh, recognizing that, that their children are using these tools and using, uh, and that there could be, you know, obviously there are benefits. Um, but I wonder, um, um, is there a deliberate effort in in what you're um, in in the work that you're reviewing and, and actively involved in to teach youth about cybersecurity um, and risks in the cyber uh, environment um, while recognizing uh, you know all the benefits of the tool? Um, Toyin, could I ask you to remark on that? Yes, thank you, Maria. Yeah. Um, we do share information, especially on social media, um, a lot about um, um, cybersecurity and you know young people being safe online. Um, especially like in this period of the pandemic, we had shared information around like how what how do you recognize you know fake news, fake. Um, um, stories around COVID-19. How do you not even engage in certain conversations online? How do you identify that this is probably not um, um, uh, an actual person that you're speaking to online and all of that? When you meet people on Facebook, when you meet people on Twitter, like what are the things that you can talk about? What are the things that are safe to share with someone who you're meeting online? So those are some of the contents that we can sh we have shared on social media and. Um, Sometimes when we get, you know, questions related to those kind of things, specifically, especially like around, um, especially on the MyQ platform, the SMS-based platform, we share information and then we encourage the young person to even call in and have a full-blown conversation, a detailed conversation with the counselor. And so the counselor is able to give more, you know, um, information that is based on evidence and not just um, um, op just an opinion. And so that in that way, we try to um, engage young people and, show, and be sure that you know, they are being safe online. But I will also say that, that in providing sexual reproductive health information and uh, sexual, and, sexual and reproductive health information, that it's not um, very obvious that you're trying to also share how to be safe online because even as you're saying it, I'm thinking of it, I'm thinking, yes, you're providing information about what is a contraceptive, what are different options, what are what's available to a young person, where can you go, you know, to get info to get um, the services and all of that. But that's just catering to a specific need. And I'm also learning here that it's it's also good to balance like both the for the right information you're providing as part of the technical information with some safety information as well i think everybody who's providing um services online for young people need to put that into consideration that there definitely needs to be that element of you know ensuring safety even as things are, are becoming more worrisome and i also say that in terms of parents and teachers and adults and other people who are gatekeepers in, in, in young people's lives, there's also a lack of um, knowledge or skill on how to protect young people online. So the, the go-to response is to say, don't use or stop using or this is too much. But there's actually steps that adults can take 
to ensure the safety of um, of their wards and, and 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 children online. And I think it's it's. It's important that adults actually, parents, teachers, and everybody actually need to pick up the skills, learn those skills, and you know, safeguard um, young people rather than just say, don't use, you know, don't don't go there, don't explore, because they will definitely explore. Even if it is not in your presence, they will still find opportunities to do so. so Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, so before we go to a couple last questions, we still do have. Um, uh, another five minutes, which are six minutes, which is wonderful. Um, I want to just uh, remind everyone, first of all, that, um, you know, this is obviously not enough time ever. Um, we're so grateful to have both um, of our presenters. And of course, um, we could we could talk for hours. Um, there are more opportunities um, in this summit to connect and to continue these conversations. And so uh, number one, um, there is a marketplace event that, that happens shortly um, uh, in about a half hour after we end here, um, where there are uh, going to be additional presentations uh, specifically about digital health. And then later in the day, there is something called networking, um, where you can just connect and talk with people. So please do not hesitate to utilize those um, to continue these conversations. Um, I wanted to um, just follow up on, on what Toyin was just speaking to, um, uh, you know, the reality that our children are in the digital world, um, that as parents, uh, speaking for myself, um, that is uh, the baseline um, to start from. Uh, and, and then to be looking for how to support uh, not just them, but of course, um, you know, all children to have um, information and to use this tool. Um, Chandra, I'm interested in, uh, there's so much information in the digital world. There's so much to grab their attention, to, um, uh, to suck them in you know, for good or otherwise. And I'm interested in how you uh, bring these tools um, into their attention in a way that, uh, that, that, that keeps them engaged. How do you compete with everything else that they have access to? Thank you. Um, and with your permission, Maria, I, I'm going to also speak as a parent. Um, you know, uh, I grew up in a, um, uh, in a loving, caring family, highly educated parents, middle class family. But neither my parents of my parents uh, drank alcohol, and alcohol was taboo in the home. And of course, they didn't talk to me about sex at all. Um, and so I learned to drink outside the home. Got drunk terribly many times. Uh, that didn't happen to my son because he learned to drink at home. He learned that it was perfectly okay to drink. I taught him how to drink. For instance, I told him, if you're going for a party, you know, have a glass of water, have a beer, have a piece of cheese, have another glass of water, and then space your drinks. You know, you talk to them uh, so that they learn how to deal with it. And the worst thing that can happen is the, is the computer um, in the bedroom of a child or an adolescent with the door shut and no, no communication with the parents. So I think this is a tool a powerful tool for good and a powerful tool for harm and bad. And I think uh, parents need to, as a Parajita uh, uh, um, you know, prompted us to discuss, uh, need to engage and point to this. You know, my son is 31 years old, but in the, when he started using the internet um, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, he would come and tell me, you know, uh, uh, that this is, this is what is happening. And where did you read this? In the internet. You know, so it's almost like this is given. Uh, and so how do you get people to challenge and understand, as Toyin said, you know, try to make sense of, you know, what would, be, could this be verified? And that's, that's very difficult to do. You know, those are things over time, you, you, you triangulate and you, you check these things. So I, th I think the only way uh, to do this is in a partnership. It's a learning partnership in which adults uh, have to work with adolescents in the school, in the home, and in the community to see that there is this resource that you can enormously leverage for good, but it can draw you into fundamentalism. It can, my wife is a psychiatrist. She's dealing with patients here in Switzerland <clears throat> who can go to a site which tell you about anorexia and you know all the things that you can do to, uh, to, um, uh, to hide what you're taking from your doctors. You know, you have websites which teach young people that. Uh, and, and of course, these are dangerous things. You know, there's a lot of grooming on the web. 
So these are things that need to be done and cannot be happen with the adult and the adolescent in two parts of the room and the door closed. And it also cannot happen if the, uh, the computer or the mobile phone is seen as a device that parents can dump in the kids' hands and have some free time. So, you know, this, yeah. is, uh, yeah. this is very much to do with good parenting and good teaching. So good I, I appreciate that so much, um, uh, speaking also as a mother. So I, I, um, I want to just uh, thank our, our presenters. Um, uh, it, it has been a, a really fabulous conversation. Um, again, uh, you can um, continue to engage um, everything from this session will be available as a recording, so you will be able to come back to it. Um, I want to just point out to a note that it, it looks like uh, Toyin's organization since 2005 has reached over a million young people. So these are tools that, um, that are doing something right, um, and we can learn from each other absolutely. Um, the next step for everyone, um, once we leave here, um, please just go back to the website, Lives in the balancesummit.org, livesinthebalancesummit.org, um, and that's where you will learn, scroll through that website and you'll see all of um, the links to take you to um, additional, to watch the additional live stream and also uh, to um, engage. Um, thank you so much, Chandra, Toyin, from all over the world. Thank you, everyone, for joining us in this. Thank uh, you, Maria. Thank, thank you, COVID. Jack. Thank you, Toyan, and my friends. For thank you for joining in. See you in the marketplace in a few minutes. See you soon. <laughs>